Welcome to Small Cap Nation. I'm Jane King at the New York Stock Exchange. And with me today, Dr. Matthew Codaro, energy expert, uh, board of LIPA, the Long Island Power Authority, a former CEO of several energy companies, an academic as well. So just an overall expert on the energy industry. And um, we know this is a crucial industry to how the world operates, so yes, especially oil. So um, let's talk about oil because this has been an interesting, strange trip. Uh, that crude has been on over the past 18 months or so, starting to get a little life to it lately. Um, what's the latest thinking on oil prices? Well, it, uh, the, um, the meeting of the, um, uh, the oil producers in Doha was a, uh, you know, a, a big uh, disappointment, mm -hmm. uh, although those close to the uh, industry were not expecting anything big to come out of that. Uh, Iran had already announced that it wasn't going to buy into a freeze of production, uh, and Saudi Arabia had indicated it wasn't going to come on board if uh, uh, not all the producers uh, were going to freeze the, the, their output. So it, it was not much to be expected from that. I think the good part of it, at least they're talking to mm -hmm. each other and, uh, and things are happening, uh, there was an expectation that um, that would have a severe impact, the fact that they didn't come to any agreement on the oil market. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, it didn't have really a very, te didn't. very temporary yeah. impact. And uh, there's, there's a, a couple of main reasons for that. First, there was a strike in Kuwait, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a worker strike, which uh, eliminated some production and put some pressure on the prices and sort of uh, negated the whole impact of uh, the bad outcome of uh, Doha. Um, and then the IEA had uh, done some work and, and uh, carried out an analysis which said that uh, because of the decreasing production a m among the non-OPEC producers, uh, they expected the price of oil to actually stabilize because there'd be some sort of pullback in, in, in output. Now, I think the, the fact that Kuwait was out of operation for a couple of days and there, there uh, was uh, an increase in price sort of demonstrates that that's the case. And uh, especially in the U.S., um, the, the projection is that uh, there will be a, a significant cutback, especially in the, uh, uh, the LTOs, the, uh, the shale deposits and drilling new, new production facilities. So um, uh, the thinking is, and, and the IEA has, has indicated, that um, oil will stabilize probably in, the, in, in price in the second half of uh, 2016, if not in the early part of 2017, to somewhere around 50 to 60 dollars a barrel. I think 60 is the limit because 60 is a magic, a magic number, 60 dollars a barrel, because at that price, uh, the uh, U.S. producers will start drilling again, and uh, it's economical for them to bring on board uh, uh, their uh, uh, their facilities. So uh, that, that you know, that's a major. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I, I think we see uh, a, a daily drama unfold where there's press releases and the traders uh, playing us to the hilt on a short-term basis where we have volatility. Um, I, but in a, uh, for the most part, I think we will see that go away in time and there'll be this stabilization uh, around $60. And, and the thinking in the industry is that we've reached the low point. The, the low point has been reached at somewhere around $27 uh, a barrel. And that on the curve of recovery, we're somewhere between depression and hope. Okay. And so things are... <laughs> it was are, pretty bleak there for a while. Yeah, so, so things are uh, mm -hmm. on the upswing and there's a, an expectation that in, indeed we will have this stabilization in, in, in price. Now you mentioned OPEC. How do you see the U.S.-Saudi relationship right now? Well, I, I th with with all the news, I think the, the, the Saudi-U.S. relationship is still a, a very good one, and, and we're very close with them and coordinate things with them. There, there are the political problems, which are um, somewhat blown out of proportion by the, by the media, I think. And, and Saudi has their political problems, and Saudi is an arch enemy of Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one reason why we don't have the agreement. I think uh, the, the Saudis are watching what Iran does. And if Iran doesn't play, the Saudis are not going to play as far as cutbacks. But what we need is a cutback. You know, right now, um, all the major producers are uh, turning out a lot of oil. They're at the, pretty much the top level of, of their production ca uh, capability. So even if there was a freeze, 
not much would happen. Um, what's needed is a cut. And I don't think anyone's ready uh, for that cut. Uh, so that sets the stage for uh, a uh, reduction in, in production by the non-OPEC nations, especially the U.S., to influence the price. Now we got to talk about coal because this is another industry. It's just been really decimated. Yes, I think you could say that. I mean, there's Peabody, Arch. I mean, all these companies have filed for bankruptcy. Uh, how do you see the coal industry? Is there any hope for coal? Well, there's tremendous pressure on the coal industry, and, and they're in for, for some tough times. I think one of the big challenges right now is how what we do with the existing coal plants as uh, uh, the pressure is put on for uh, as far as climate change and, and to clean up this electric generation uh, by coal. One of the things that uh, is a possibility for doing this uh, is the use of biofuels in place of coal. In this country, um, there's coal firing going on in a few installations where they burn both coal and oil, uh, uh, coal and biofuel. And as a result, they're able to back, up, uh, back away from uh, uh, heavy utilization of coal. The, the interesting thing is that uh, they're doing a lot of work in, in Northern Europe, and an outstanding example is the Aberdell plant in, in Denmark, where they are uh, refitting a large uh, coal unit there to burn wood chips, a sustainable fuel, uh, and provide electricity to something like 1.3 million uh, customers, and also heat to uh, 200,000 customers. And they're, and, and they're doing this with a sustainable fuel, and they're doing this uh, with a 97% uh, efficiency factor, and they are reducing uh, CO2 emissions compared to the existing facility by over a million tons a year. So uh, everyone's watching that, sure. and, and whether Maybe that's successful, and, mm -hmm. it's a, a, and it is an excellent one. This country hasn't taken that step uh, to any great degree, anyway, uh, as of yet. But that's something to keep our eye on. Biofuels uh, may play a role. Uh, especially in this pressure to get away from coal. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadar, for sharing your insight with us today. And thank you as well for joining us on Small Cap Nation for more interesting interviews and also an insight into some interesting companies and what they're doing. You can go to smallcapnation.com.